Hello, I'm Justin Wheeler, and welcome to this episode of Nonstop Nonprofit. Quick, before we start the podcast, if you're a nonprofit marketer and you haven't seen what happened when Action Against Hunger added fundraisers' pop up donation forms to their website, do yourself a favor and take a look. Well, wait. The results they saw are so incredible that you'll immediately understand why Action Against Hunger's digital lead, Andrew Chappelle, said it was the single biggest contribution to their successful revenue gains in 2020. Of course, after working closely with Andrew and knowing how he achieved these amazing results for Action Against Hunger, it became obvious that inviting him on the Nonstop Nonprofit podcast would result in game-changing advice for nonprofits ready to increase donations. I also took a chance and let Andrew take the podcast hosting reins. He brought some hard-hitting questions to the table. And I think, I hope, I answered everything with the same kind of openness and thoughtfulness that Andrew offered when I interviewed him. Now, a warning regarding this episode. We can barely contain the guidance that Andrew offers. So get ready to take notes and set up your own smart opportunities for nonprofit growth, an immensely improved giving experience, and infinitely increased donations. You won't want to lose a moment after you hear what he has to say. Let's dive in. It is your number one priority to ensure that your business can continue to deliver on its mission, whether it's this year, next year, and beyond. I'm always so baffled when I when I do webinars. There's always somebody at the end who raises their hand and says, I'm the development director. Should I have access to the budget? <laughs> I'm always like, yes, you've got to know that. The best thing that we can do is just raise as much money as possible and then give it to the people around the world. If you're going to be sustainable, you have to have a multi-channel strategy to reach all of these different generations of donors however they want to be reached. The best thing you can ever do as a nonprofit leader is spend as much money as possible on your story. And it snowballs like any peer-to-peer campaign. The more people that view this content, the further and further it grows. Then you're doing it wrong. That is unacceptable and that is not the way to run a board. The more nonprofits can give their donor base that experience of the impact that's being made on the ground level, there's nothing else you have to give someone. This is Nonstop Nonprofit. Hey, listeners, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Nonstop Nonprofit. Super excited to dig into some questions with Andrew from Action Against Hunger. He heads up marketing at an organization based out of New York, doing amazing work around the globe. Andrew, thank you for joining the podcast today. Thanks, Justin. It's nice to be here. Before we get too far into all things marketing, I'd love to, if you could share with listeners a little bit more about Action Against Hunger and and how you got involved with with the organization. Sure. So Action Against Hunger is a global nonprofit organization, humanitarian organization that fights hunger and malnutrition. It's been active for more than 40 years and works in over nearly 50 countries. It typically serves about 17 million people each year. So it focuses both on acute treatment as well as prevention, as well as some innovative program practices around like sustainable livelihoods. At Action Against Hunger, I'm wow. the digital lead. So I oversee our digital strategy, as well as our website, including CRO and SEO, as well as our paid advertising program. And in terms of how I came to Action Against Hunger, I started there in 2019 after working in the corporate space for several years. So I worked as a freelancer, as well as a consultant, a digital marketing manager at startups, as well as places like Penguin Random House and Condé Nast. And prior to that, I actually worked in nonprofits for about eight years at an organization called the Rainforest Alliance. So from nonprofit to the corporate sector, and then hopefully taking some of those learnings from the corporate sector back to nonprofits as I came back to Action Against Hunger. That's awesome. What what would you say are some of the, the maybe unique challenges that you experience running marketing, digital marketing at a nonprofit versus a corporation? You know, I think um, a couple of the unique challenges there, I would say, at a nonprofit And there's sometimes at a nonprofit, there are, you know, I think we all know we deal with a shortage of resources. We're all wearing a lot of hats. We're trying to do a lot of different things. Coming back from the corporate sector to nonprofits, I noticed that we had some data gaps. So there were a lot of things that we didn't actually know and that we needed to find out as a challenge. And then I think one of the other challenges we face, and you might have a similar experience as a digital marketer in a nonprofit, is just sort of selling the value of digital marketing at the nonprofit in the Mm -hmm. nonprofit space. I think there's still sometimes a sense that, you know, we don't want to run ads. We're not advertisers, you know. So I think showing the value of digital marketing is also one of the challenges 
how has that been? Because I, I feel like we've been working, Fundraiser's been working with Action Against Hunger, I think since 2017, maybe. So a little a little ahead of your time. And it, I feel like, you know, at least since 2019 onward, I've seen a lot more on the digital front. You know, I've seen a lot more ads. So like, how has that transition been for the organization? And how has sort of the results kind of followed as you've gotten more into you know the paid media and and the other sort of marketing efforts you mentioned as part of your role. Yeah, so we ran our first pilot in digital advertising in 2019. Uh, that's that's when I came out, and they sort of brought me on to manage that and run that. Um, previously, like a lot of nonprofits, I think we were invested heavily in direct mail rather than digital. So coming on in digital, there's the process of sort of getting your creative in line, figuring out what's going on with your donors, figuring out how to target them, and then launching it all, which can take some time. We also, at Action Against Hunger, were sort of struggling with low brand awareness. So we were founded in France, very well known in France. In the US, our brand awareness is much lower compared with other actors in this space. So we kind of had the twofold goal with our digital program of bringing on new donors, as well as raising brand awareness and increasing our reach and introducing the organization to donors as well. So those are a couple of the things that we focused on there. And we found that as we sort of ramped up the digital program, Uh, Our results were very good. We were able to quickly add new donors and then we increased our spend. And then in 2020, we had our highest revenue year ever, uh, largely due to our efforts in digital. Definitely saw a huge increase in, in your guys' online revenue as your uh, tech vendor, uh, which which is was really cool to see, which kind of leads into this next question. You know, I, I've, I've worked with and have talk, and talked with a lot of nonprofit organizations and a lot of times, you know, big or small, I see sort of this silo between marketing and fundraising. Um, and so how does, how does Action Against Hunger sort of look at the function of marketing, the function of fundraising? Uh, how do those teams collaborate, work alongside each other? Uh, I'd love to, love to understand sort of the way you guys sort of operate internally within those two teams. Yeah. So, you know, I think I'm pretty biased working in digital, but to me, marketing is fundraising. I mean, marketing uh, and fundraising yeah. is marketing. Marketing is telling the story of the organization. It's, it's introducing yourself to potential donors as well as acquiring new donors. So it is direct ask, you know, direct marketing fundraising. We do have other fundraising activities. You know, um, one of the things I think that has that the last year maybe has thrown into stark relief is just the importance and the power of digital fundraising, because I'm sure a lot of nonprofits experience this in the last year due to the pandemic. Some of your other sources of fundraising were no longer viable. So if you were doing, for instance, face-to-face fundraising, yeah. which you might be familiar with, where you're kind of on the street asking for donations, you couldn't do that anymore. Or if you depended on a big gala to fundraise for you, it wasn't it wasn't an option. And so, you know, digital fundraising became the way to fundraise in, in 2020. And uh, we were fortunate that we had invested in it uh, and that we were ready for that. Um, I think going forward, that will become increasingly, you know, sort of the way forward for fundraising. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, uh, it, the economy is turning more and more digital every year. The pandemic accelerated the necessity to be a digital first, virtual first sort of fundraising strategy as, as a nonprofit organization. And I loved, you know, the first thing you said in, in regards to the the question I asked, fundraising is marketing and marketing is fundraising. That tells me a lot about the way you you look at marketing and how Action Against Hunger treats marketing. I think it's the right way to go about it, right? I mean, those two functions uh, cannot be siloed, and when they are, that's when you see that's when you see a breakdown in sort of results, understanding, and and, and so forth. So, love that those things are top of mind. You know, you, you mentioned Action Against Hunger has low brand awareness. What on the on the paid side are you able to do? to sort of help increase that brand awareness, at least here in in, in the United States? Or or I should say, how do you think about digital marketing differently for brand awareness versus fundraising? Yeah, so sure, I I can speak to that a little bit. So particularly in social, about 85% of our budget goes to direct acquisition. So it's just used toward getting a direct conversion. 10% of our budget goes to awareness raising, and then 5% goes to lead gen. So that that 10% we put toward awareness raising, what we do there is we actually create different creative meant to just sort of introduce uh, users to the organization, kind of raise our profile. And we also optimize for clicks in Facebook there. And 
what that does is you sort of get in front of a different audience. So when you're optimizing for clicks, Facebook's algorithm may be showing it to a different audience than if you're optimizing just for conversions. So we're really just trying to get in front of as many people as possible there, drive as many as people as possible to our website, and then they enter our remarketing program. So then they're being shown display ads, um, we're retargeting them, and we're cultivating them to become donors. So we served about 50 million impressions in uh, 2020. And there's the kind of the primary benefits of that, which is bringing on new donors as well as getting in front of new people. There are secondary benefits to that that are a little bit more intangible and a little bit difficult to measure. But we did, for instance, see because we had our ads and our organization and we're telling our story to so many more people, we saw, for instance, a large uptick in corporate partnerships more than ever before. So we were getting approached by potential corporate partners like we never were. Um, it led to some marketing opportunities and some um, kind of synergistic marketing with uh, big brands that we may have never worked with before. So. Yeah, it's bringing on new donors as well as getting out there in front of yeah. people. That's what I love about marketing, right? There's oftentimes there can be sort of this over complication to attribute every single dollar to a donation or a conversion, whatever it might be. But sometimes at the end of the day, you obviously can't do that, you know, and th being able to reach 50 million people through paid media and then to see sort of other functions of the business benefit from that, you know, through partnerships and so forth, like that's when you know marketing is working, right? And that's that's when you know that, again, you can't necessarily attribute every single dollar back to a specific result. But when you start to see the organization being lifted up in ways like it hasn't been before, that's when you know your efforts are making big impact. When you say you know, a large percentage of your budget goes to conversion or acquisition, is sort of the goal a donation immediate? Or is it collecting an email address, nurturing, and then ultimately convert to a donor sort of what does that funnel look like for you on the acquisition side? Yeah. So we have, we have a multi-level funnel, which you might be familiar with. So we have that prospecting audience where we're really just trying to drive them to the site, get them, show the video, show, tell our story, get them, get them sort of interested in us, um, kind of warmed up. And then, you know, they'll be shown that retargeting later on and sort of hopefully cultivated into a donor. We also, of course, have direct asks that we use to just kind of bring new donors on. One of the nice things about fundraise is as we make that direct ask and we get that donation, we can actually collect the email address as well. So we can then, if they do become a donor, we can then turn them into hopefully a repeat donor, hopefully a loyal supporter down the line because we can start to send them emails and, and kind of steward them that way. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I know we just launched a, a case study with you uh, in the organization, just sort of based on some uh, recent uh, success around conversions. Can you share a little bit with our audience the test that you ran? I think I think this is so important to always be testing for optimization, especially if you're you're spending a good amount on paid media. You want to know that it's working, and you want to make sure that conversion rate is as optimized as possible. So, can you share a little bit about the test that you guys ran and sort of some of the results that came as a result of those tests? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the landing page and whether that's converting is a pretty critical element as, as, of any uh, fundraising campaign. Um, in this case, we're always testing. So we're trying to improve the landing page. We're trying to convert as many users on site to donors as possible. In this case, this test that we ran, one of the really cool things about the fundraise forums is you can open them anywhere. So uh, you don't necessarily need to send a user to a traditional donate page. So what we asked is... Um, you know, what if the donor, what if the form just opens right off that donate now button in our header navigation that many nonprofits have, rather than the sort of traditional route, which is to send a donor to a donate page and then try to make the conversion there. With this variant method, the donor can make a donation anywhere they are on the site. If they're inspired to give right then, they can open the form and they can complete that transaction as quickly as possible. So we ran a test in early 2020. What we actually saw at the end of the test, the results were pretty amazing. We got a 78 percent lift in conversion rate. So we jumped our conversion rate from 38.3% to 68.3%. Uh, One-time gift conversion rate increased uh, 88%. Total value increase of 23.3% for one-time gifts and 65.8% for monthly gifts. So all of that is just to say it was really a game changer for us. It contributed, I think, to tens, wow. if not hundreds of thousands of additional revenue during the year, just because we were losing donors on that donate page. Um, of course, you also want to test and iterate on your donate page to keep that from happening, but just really pretty critical game changer there for us. That's awesome. Yeah. I always say that every page is a donation page, right? Like as you mentioned that traditionally, and what you still see a lot in, in the market today is organizations send a donor a couple clicks, send them to a new page, more content. Sometimes the form is below the fold. You got to scroll. Right? Just so many distractions and opportunities for the donor to abandon the intended sort of action that they came to take. And so I love that sort of your test 
proved out what one of the the core kind of components we've built here at, at Fundraise. Uh, but yeah, every page is a, is a donation page. Every page inspires a donor in a different way. Uh, uh, you know, and and we I often refer to it as contextualized giving. When an individual is compelled by something, there should be no distraction to get them to convert to, to donate. And so it's amazing to see those results and to hear sort of that success. And congratulations on on running an effective test. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think it was probably the single biggest contributor to our uh, successful revenue gains in 2020. One other kind of interesting thing that we did with the fundraise forms uh, is we created what we call a contextual CTA. So it's a button that can be dropped into any content piece, any story. You can customize the copy on it so that you know it's in line with what this, the content piece is. And then if the donor is inspired to give while reading through, you've got this sort of button right in the content piece as well, which again, you can just open the form. Another thing that was helpful to us is we, inc- we moved to V2 of fundraise forms and we increased the amount of payment forms we accept. So we were able to add Apple Pay, we were able to add PayPal recurring gifts and providing these additional options for donors too was um, really helpful in terms of increasing revenue. We added more PayPal recurring gifts that we didn't have before and so on. More Apple Pay gifts, yeah, it was great. Yeah, awesome. That's good to hear. Yeah, giving donors the ability to give through the method they wanna give is certainly important. I hope to see you guys get that Bitcoin up on there soon too as well. So start start accepting some of that Bitcoin money. That is great to hear. Any other sort of outside of sort of the optimization of that conversion, any other you know tips or tricks that you've learned over the last couple of years being at Action Against Hunger as a marketer that you've seen help increase sort of the results that you're looking for? Anything that you think would be worth sharing with our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I have a few. So I think for a successful fundraising campaign, Um, You're really looking at three elements there. So you've got your creative, uh, you've got your targeting, and then you've got your landing page. And I think, you know, sometimes you run campaigns where you're not necessarily driving people to a landing page. Most of the time you are. It's really important that all three of these things are sort of uh, working well together and that they're all optimized. So I think it's important to kind of look at your metrics as you're running these campaigns. You know, you might see with your creative, if you're creative, you're not seeing very good engagement. You're not seeing a high relevance score in Facebook. You're not seeing a very good click-through rate. You might have an issue with your creative. So your metrics can kind of inform where in that journey uh, you might be going wrong. If, for instance, instead you're seeing high engagement on this ad, uh, you're seeing a high click-through rate, but then you're just not converting, then you might want to look at your landing page. So those are some of the some of the sort of, you know, when you've got each element there working and kind of firing on all cylinders, that's the key to a successful campaign. You're engaging them, you're driving them, and you're converting them. Another thing that's worked really well for me in my experience is just video. So I'd recommend, especially in mm-hmm. social, that you, if you can, because not, not all nonprofits have the resources to produce it, but if you can produce video, it's dynamic, it's visual, it gets users' attention right in the feed. And in my experience, it's the best way to tell your nonprofit story. You take them there, you take them on the ground, you show them the work you're doing, you sort of transport them that way. Um, and you get them engaged. So I'd say video. And I'd also note that most of our donors are coming from mobile. So make sure you're using the video, you're optimizing it in an aspect ratio that looks great on mobile, takes up the most phone real estate there or device real estate that can help as well. So those are a few of the tricks, a few of the tips I can give there. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. And let's talk a little bit about budget because obviously when you're distributing content and you're trying to get, you know, good results, you got to pay for it and nothing's free. Um, how how do you go about budgeting for paid media? And you know, is it is it a percentage of revenue? Uh, is it okay? Here's the goals from from the executive team. This is how much budget we're going to need to achieve it. How do you plan sort of your media budget uh, for a given year? And what sort of return is expected from your team as a result of that budget? Yeah. So our budget, you know, when we first started with our pilot in 2019, we ran what was pretty much just a test pilot to see how we would do there. Our budget increased from 2019 to 2020 by 66%. And then again, uh, by 40% based on the results. So what we do is we actually project out. So this is another um, thing I should add here. So it's not really enough just to look at the performance metrics of your ad campaign. It's also really critical that you understand who your donors are for targeting purposes, but also that you understand their behavior. You need to understand uh, their giving behavior, when they're giving, how much they're worth, generally on average, how long they're retained. So there's a lot of data and analytics that go into running sort of the successful campaign there. So what we do is we collect that information and it's some data analysis. It takes some time. And then we know, for instance, an average donor is worth this amount. 
which means we can acquire them at this amount, which means that into the future, projecting out, they will be worth this amount to us down the line. So we have those revenue targets, and then we budget accordingly based on trying to hit those revenue targets into the future. And you need to leave yourself some wiggle room there. And I think you need to also make it clear always to the executive team that it is a projection. And so you may or may not <laughs> get there. Um, hopefully you do. Hopefully you do. And another thing I would I would note is when you see some success, make sure that whether you're running it yourself or working with an agency, that you can scale that effectively. Because a, a common mistake that I've seen in my own career, as, as well as at other nonprofits, is you start to have some success in your paid media. And then you sort of, everyone says, this is great. It's working great. Let's put some more funds into this. Uh, but then you don't, you're not able to scale effectively because you can't just put as much more budget as possible into something. You know, you might find that your conversions in that audience are no longer there. So it's important to scale efficiently, make sure you're still hitting your CPA and also think about not just scaling vertically in terms of putting more budget into the uh, ads that are working, but scaling horizontally in terms of finding new audiences, finding more audiences and expanding the amount of audiences that you're getting in front of. So that's that's what I would I would say in terms of um, budgeting. Just make sure you know what your goals are, and really you, you have to have that understanding of of your donor behavior. Otherwise, you're sort of flying blind. And I think that's a, a mistake a lot of nonprofits make. Is let's just try some ads. We don't really know necessarily what our donors are worth, how often they give, how long they stay on file, and you're sort of flying blind if you don't know that. Yeah. So in, in terms of the acquisition, the paid budget, right? You've obviously got a donor file. You've got, you know, you've got a huge file of donors. And so how, how much of sort of the paid media goes to targeting those donors that you already have their information and, and trying to get them to donate versus net new acquisition of new donors that you don't even have in your file? How do you separate sort of the budget, if at all, to kind of accommodate the two different audiences? We don't currently have a budget set aside for retention. Uh, although you will find, okay. I think, as you run paid advertising, that you're that you're not just acquiring new donors, but that you're actually reactivating donors that you may not have been engaged with for a while. So one of the strategies there is we pull a lapsed donor file from our CRM, uh, and then we try to show our ads to donors who we know have given in the past. And a lot of the time we bring them back on, and in some cases we've even brought on back on major donors. Another strategy for retention, I would say, for so your retention budget versus your acquisition budget, is you can often just use posts that are working in your organic social. And a lot of the times with Facebook's algorithm now, those organic posts, depending on the size of your audience, they may not be in seat, be you know, being seen, you can take those successful organic posts people are engaging with and just turn them into retention ads because you know, your audience is engaging mm. with them. You, they, you know, you know, you, they're liking them. Um, and then you just show them even without an ask um, just to kind of retain them. And then we also use email for retention as well. Uh, so I hope that answers your, your question it. in terms of where yeah. we focus our budget. No, it definitely does. One last question here. And then I know you have a couple questions uh, for, for me. But I hear a lot of organizations say that digital fundraising, media spend, it's low dollar fundraising. It's only going to attract sort of the annual donors, individuals, you know, not, the, not the major donors and, and so forth. Is that, is that true in your guys' efforts or are you seeing a, a pretty diverse uh, demographic of donors giving through your marketing efforts? Uh, no, in our case, it's not. You know, your average gift is often going to vary by channel. So that's an important thing to measure as well in terms of what level these donors are at by channel. You might have, for instance, lower dollar donors coming in on social than you do in some of your other channels. But we've seen donors come in across our entire, uh, all of our giving levels. So we've got low dollar individuals. Uh, we've got some mid-level donors, and then we have major donors coming in as well. I'd also say, uh, don't be afraid to go after those new major donors in your acquisition. So there's targeting you can use in Facebook, for instance, where you can target by um, uh, income level or lifestyle or some of these demographic, um, perhaps, you know, different cultural interests. So you can actually go after major donors in your acquisition as well. So uh, don't be afraid to do that. Got it. And to your point earlier about sort of the analysis, a lot of times in my experience when I was uh, fundraising, we would acquire donors. I mean, typically people, when they give the first, the first time online, for the most case, you know, it's it's not going to be at their full capacity, right? It's, it's oh, I, I saw this ad or I learned about this organization and uh, I'm going to make a contribution because it was compelling. And then if you're able to analyze the data and, and we, you know, we, we help organizations do this through fundraisers to provide wealth information, uh, specifically, so you understand, okay, this person gave a hundred bucks, but they actually have the capacity to give 10 grand. Okay. So we're going to, you know, we're going to nurture this donor in a little bit differently. Or they're going to go to our major gifts team uh, to really start building a relationship. And so that's another 
really effective way I, I've seen digital use, specifically paid you know, advertisements used is, is you do grab high net worth donors who are giving below their capacity, but are able to obviously upgrade uh, they're giving uh, as you build the relationship. And so I, I definitely agree with sort of the approach you guys are taking and, and have, have experienced that as, as well. Friends and listeners, we're about to do something we've never done before on the nonstop nonprofit podcast. Turn interviewer into interviewee and vice versa. Andrew came to the podcast with questions for fundraise. And since we're always up for a challenge, we're handing him the mic. Uh, sure. Yeah. One of my questions was just sort of what inspired you initially to found fundraise and what sort of gaps or discrepancies did you see in existing fundraising software that you wanted to solve for? And the secondary question there is, how, do you feel like you solved them or are there more to <laughs> kind of go after in the future? Yeah, no, we're, no, we're never done innovating. We're never done building at fundraise. Lots more problems that we can solve and uh, lots more product that we can ship to our customers to enable them to uh, continue growing. So we're never we're never done there. Uh, but in terms of what what inspired me, so I spent 12 years fundraising. I started two nonprofit organizations, uh, raised raised about 100 million uh, over the the course of those 12 years through digital fundraising campaigns, and used everything and even built our own stuff for for different campaigns. And the initial sort of like challenge was we were using a giving form or giving page that was redirected off of our our domain. We had very little control of. And so we couldn't control the branding we could, and, and it didn't feel proprietary to sort of our organization. And so that was sort of the first, like, I, I think that like more nonprofits, bigger and small, want to really own the donor experience, want it to look proprietary. Donors don't care about third-party tech vendor. They really care about the brand they're supporting. Uh, and so that just the lack of customization was, was like the first sort of problem I wanted to solve. And then also just the the intelligence. So when we launched Fundraise, we launched just as a giving form. Uh, and we called it like the, the a smart giving form because a donor would come in and give, you know, five, maybe five pieces of information about themselves. And we were able to uh, produce 10 to 15 more attributes that would make you a better fundraiser and also save you time. Uh, as, as a former you know fundraiser, I would spend uh, lots of time doing the research uh, trying to understand people's uh, ability, capacity, and it just took so much time. So we really wanted to try to automate that as much as possible and make that into the payment flow uh, as part of the donor journey. And then, uh, lastly, just the, like the amount of friction that you often see. I mean, it's for many nonprofits, it's easier for their donors to buy toilet paper on Amazon than it is to make a contribution on your website. And I did not want to see any more bad giving experiences because. Organ nonprofits are solving the world's most important challenges, uh, and we shouldn't add a layer of friction uh, to to a donor. And so, at at the end of it, it was wanting to build super smooth giving experiences, and then also a lot of social organizations are using three, four, five different pieces of software. And so, our goal was also to cons help consolidate that and try to do as much as possible within the fundraise platform, uh, so that you're not having to spend uh, you know a bunch of money on technology that ideally could be done in in one place. Uh, so that's that was really the the initial sort of um, inspiration to to get the the company started. And as as we've grown over the last six years, you know, working with thousands of nonprofits, really our our focus now is as a company is how do we help you know our our customers, our prospects, really raise more money online. And so where we're headed from a roadmap perspective and from a product perspective is more payment features, more opportunities for nonprofits to engage across multiple channels to really utilize just the the acceleration of, of the digital economy for their own uh, growth opportunities. And so that's really where we're focused is a lot more on the payment side. Uh, FinTech is a, a big play that we're bringing into the, into the platform to help organizations leverage uh, some unique opportunities there as well. So from a high level, that's, that's, uh, that's who we, what was the inspiration and where we're going as a company? Yeah, that's great. And I think that's so needed. You know, there's so many, one of the things, and I think this is actually true across both the corporate and nonprofit sector is there's a lot of um, data and system fragmentation and system siloing. So having a system that uh, can kind of do a lot of what you need to do is great. One of my other questions for you is just in terms of the innovations, things coming down the road, are there any things that relate directly to digital marketing 
in my experience with fundraise uh, beyond the forum opening, which was a, a huge kind of game changer for us. Another thing that uh, I worked with you on is that we, we didn't know very much about where our donors were coming from. So we were kind of, you know, I use the kind of the metaphor of a boat, like we were sort of just taking all of our donors and putting them on the same boat. Um, so one of the things I implemented when I came on was just UTM tracking. And I talked with you all at fundraise and I said, I need to be able to track these donors. So we were using JavaScript on the site to kind of pull the UTM in and then send it somewhere um, to our, you know, our various tracking devices and fundraise immediately responded. And within two weeks, I was able to collect those UTM uh, fields in fundraise, which is great. And has been super helpful for us in terms of, um, you know, knowing where donors are coming from and therefore what they're worth and their behavior and cohorts going forward. So I guess just, just what are you all thinking about in terms of additional innovations in digital marketing that might help marketers going forward? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. So one of the obvious is just more more functionality around uh, sort of our email capabilities, right? Like today, it's like pretty standard when a donor does this or, or you know, very pretty standard to a few different kind of components of fundraise. Um, and while like, you know, we're not, we're not trying to maybe replace your, your like enterprise ESP, uh, there should be automations that you can build and trigger within fundraise when something happens, right? We're currently scoping out a lot more sort of email functionality that I think will give marketers the ability to create easier automations based off of uh, donor behavior or, you know, for instance, as an example, like low hanging fruit, abandoned cart opportunities when someone, you know, enters some information, but then leaves the form, making it easier within fundraise to actually go after and acquire that donor, maybe serve an ad to them uh, or, or, you know, be able to email a few times, but create an email journey. So thinking, thinking there about, about that, also, like we do have like a fundraise aware script, which I think you, you've probably injected in, in the head of your website, but expanding sort of the capabilities of, of what that can do and what type of information that can that can collect on your web traffic and how that relates to, to different programs within fundraise that you could run, uh, whether it's donor acquisition, retention, recurring donor program, things, things of, of, of that nature. Uh, so just more enhancements around the fundraise aware script that's, that's on, on the site. Those are top of mind because those things we're actively discussing today. And we've talked about tighter integration sort of with like Facebook Ad Studio and, and other sort of ad programs, bringing that into the fundraise platform. They, all these sites have APIs where you could you could bring that in and you know really live in one place. And so outside of that, I'd love to speak with you more and see what other ideas you might have or what are some pain points that you have and how we can help uh, drive even more success for you guys in the coming years. Yeah, that's great. I mean, one of the things I really appreciate about fundraise is that you all are always constantly innovating and you're kind of on the cutting edge of what's happening there. Um, even just to circle back to the suggestion around uh, crypto. So, you know, fundraise allows you to accept Bitcoin, uh, which is great. And one thing I would say, too, for other nonprofits out there, we started uh, accepting crypto uh, just at the end of last year, and it's really been a huge revenue driver for us this year. There are concerns around that, of course, if you're an environmental nonprofit, um, you have to decide if it's right for you in terms of the environmental impacts, which we hope to see improvement on, but definitely consider it um, because there are a lot of donors out there with um, a lot of wealth and crypto willing and ready to give, and they just need a place to give. So think about it. Um, hopefully we see improvement in the environmental impacts into the future. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think with uh, with Elon Musk's uh, call out there in Bitcoin, I think we'll probably start to see some uh, some better practice there. But you're totally right; it's a it's a it's a totally new asset class, right? So like when you're going after crypto donors, it's a different donor demographic, right? It's it's net new donors for the for the most part. Um, so it's it's definitely an, inter an interesting audience uh, to to target for sure. Andrew, thank you so much for joining the podcast and sharing. Uh, I know that. You're busy ending hunger. And so to take carve out 30 minutes to, to join us on the podcast, we really do appreciate that. Thanks for having me, Justin. It was nice to be here today. All right. Have a good one. Talk soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Nonstop Nonprofit. This podcast is brought to you by your friends at Fundraise, nonprofit fundraising software built by nonprofit people. If you'd like to continue the conversation, find me on LinkedIn or text me at 562-242-8160. And don't forget to get your next episode the second it hits the internets. Go to nonstopnonprofitpodcast.com and sign up for email notifications today. See you next time.